Walt Disney said, the real trouble with the world is that too many people grow up. They forget, they don't remember what it's like to be 12 years old. When we're young, we can be in such a hurry to, to grow up, to get an education, to gain experience, to get a job, to do things right. But is it possible that we're actually at our best when we're new, naive and childlike? While physical aging may be inevitable, is it possible to continue living and working with the childlike wonder that was once so natural for us? I was thrown into management uh, a bit as a child. Uh, 24 years old, a year out of business school, I was working for Oracle at the time, this young maverick software company that's doubling in size every year. After a year of teaching Oracle technology, I was put in charge of training for the entire company and given a commission, build Oracle University. Now, I don't know about you, but to me that sounded like a grown-up job and not one that I was ready for and not one that I actually wanted. But a little voice inside my head, probably my emerging grown-up voice, said, you know, it's probably not smart to start your career by turning down a promotion. So I agreed. Uh, and with a little direction from my management, I went to work with, with no grand vision and no real clue how to build said university. So I asked a lot of questions, uh, the naive questions, like, what's the most important thing for us to get right? We kept it simple. We were scrappy, but we moved really fast. I stayed close to the, the product and sales leaders because I was a total rookie, and, and they were my adult supervision, um, my, my lifeline. You know, the company continued to grow. I was having the absolute time of my life. Uh, that is, until my boss sat me down and explained that due to this incredible growth the company was experiencing, we now needed an experienced manager to lead Oracle University. He then told me that the next day, a candidate was coming in to interview for the job. My job. A job that I, I loved. You know, it was, it was devastating, and it was also kind of confusing because I couldn't figure out, was I, was I fired or just demoted, or was there really a difference between these two? But there was one thing that I felt certain of, and that is I was right. This, this indeed was a grown-up job. The next day, a man named Jay, who looked just every part the experienced manager, came in, met with me, and then interviewed with the executive team. Meanwhile, I weigh my options. Should I, should I leave the company or should I stay and learn from this experienced manager who was brought in to replace inexperienced me? Well, it turns out my ruminations were, were totally unnecessary because the following day, my boss comes into my office and very awkwardly announces, Liz, we've decided not to hire Jay or anyone else to take over Oracle University. We'd like you to stay in the job. <laughs> What? I mean, I'm still reeling from having been fired two days earlier, and I'm not really comfortable with this new offer letter in my, in my hands, and I'm actually wondering, like, this grown-up world actually is confusing, if not a little bit crazy. Uh, he then apologized with grace, and he said, I misjudged. When I went to ask the executives for feedback on this candidate, they were confused. In fact, some of them were downright mad. They didn't know why I was bringing in someone for the job, they assured me that you and your team were doing a great job and they were adamant that you stay in the role. Why would they choose the rookie? I mean, I still didn't know what I was doing. I was figuring this out. I wondered and I began to realize because I had no real agenda of my own, I sought guidance. I, I stayed close to my stakeholders. I needed their feedback. What my team and I lacked in our experience, we compensated for in our willingness to learn, to think creatively, and to deliver quick wins. My boss, Bob, would occasionally tease me, telling people how underqualified I was for this big job that I had. And in my defense, you know, the only thing I could say is, who wants a job they're qualified for? You know, there'd be absolutely nothing to learn. And I came to realize that the best jobs are the ones we're not fully prepared for. After another 12 years of these kind of oversized management jobs, my learning curve eventually flattened out. And I was finally legit. You know, I was actually qualified for my job. And this is when the crisis came. Because, you know, professionally speaking, I felt like a grown-up. 
but I wasn't having fun, and I felt stuck and, and stagnant. Seeing some of these early signs of burnout in me, my then boss, John, he sentenced me to go play. He said, use up your vacation balance. I don't want to see you for three weeks. So my husband and I decided we would serve out this sentence in Maui uh, with, our, with our three children, ages seven, five, and three. Well, now everyone knows there is no such thing as a vacation with small children. It's only work moved to a different location. In this case, Kanapali Beach. And, uh, you know, for the first few days of this vacation, I was in my normal mom mode of hurry and worry, like hurry up, time to go, get your shoes on, you need more sunscreen, stay with the group, you need a timeout, you need a nap. And at the end of the day, I fall into bed exhausted, wondering, you know, do I get to cross, have fun off my to-do list today? <laughs> After about a week, I finally began to just slow down. That day, it began just the way the other mornings had, get the kids dressed, fed, slathered in sunscreen so we could go off and play. Now, my husband, he left the hotel room first with the two oldest children in tow, the easy children, <laughs> and he left me with the three-year-old. And he was headed for the breakfast area with the girls. Christian and I were to catch up. They were about 100 yards away. Now, Christian, is the one bouncing between the beds in his pajamas with absolutely no intention of breakfast. And while I'm plotting how to extract him from the hotel room, he's plotting his raid of the minibar. <laughs> and as I'm watching him just play in the room, I remember something that my boss had said to me maybe two months earlier. He had talked to me about his attempt to just be with his son, letting his son lead the way and set the pace. And it sounded like this really lovely idea, but it, honestly, it just sounded slow. And I didn't have time for slow. But today seemed like exactly the right time to let my son set the agenda for play and the pace. Instead of being the leader, I would follow his lead wherever he went. And we, we got out of the hotel room, and. And now with him in the lead, he meanders, you know, down this pathway, and he's stopping, you know, at every curiosity and picking up every would-be treasure along the way. We moved at a painfully slow pace. <laughs> and when I see the koi fish pond up ahead, you know, that hurry and worry mode starts to kick in, and I'm thinking, maybe he won't notice the fish, and he'll just skip merrily along the path to breakfast, and we'll catch up to the rest of the family. Well, of course he notices the fish, these little bright delights in the water, and, and he stops to inspect. So following his lead, I stop, I comment on, on the pretty fish, and I remind him that Daddy and the girls have probably finished breakfast and they'll soon be playing in the pool. A very attractive offer, right? <laughs> He's having none of this, you know, undeterred. So in surrender, I just kind of bend down and I start watching the koi fish with him. Well, at first, I, I feign interest because I've seen koi fish before. You probably have as well. I've seen them in the ancient temples in Kyoto, Japan. I've seen them at Larry Ellison's Japanese villa. I, I've seen koi fish. But now I'm down, I'm on my knees, and I am eye level with my toddler, and I'm seeing exactly what he's seeing discovering these fish, and I'm seeing these interesting colors and unique patterns and sizes, and soon the big ones come, and he's absolutely delighted, and we make this hopeless attempt to account the fish. And now he wants to touch the fish, and so he just lays down on the pathway, and he's got his hands in the water, and he's feeling their scales, and soon this frenzy of fish have come around, and he's shrieking with delight as they're lunging up and nibbling his finger, you know, thinking he's probably breakfast. <laughs> it was delightful. And that's when I just completely surrendered. And now we're both belly down, blocking the pathway, as minutes and minutes and lots of people go by. And this is when I discovered koi fish. And honestly, it's when I discovered a little part of my son. You know, instead of hurrying up for pre-scheduled play, I just slowed down and played. How much magic do we miss? Because it's not on the agenda. It's not part of our plan. 
what is it that we can't see because it's become too familiar to us? We went back to work about another two years. I ended up leaving my job at Oracle in search of something I didn't yet know how to do, which led me to become a management researcher and author because, you know, how hard could that be? <laughs> um, as I left the cradle of my career, I held this lingering question, you know, how does what we know get in the way of what we don't know but need to learn? I studied about 400 different scenarios, pieces of work, looking at how experienced people versus inexperienced people tackle the same piece of work. And what I found was surprising. When we're experienced, we, we gain knowledge and confidence and credibility. But once we have seen a pattern, once we know that pattern, we can be blind to the other possibilities. We stop asking why and we just do. We build up scar tissue, and we learn to be afraid of going down certain paths. We now have a reputation to protect, and so we don't let ourselves make mistakes or fail. Essentially, we acquire a set of adult-onset learning disabilities. And once we stop learning, we stop having fun, and we stop finding success. On the other hand, when we're inexperienced, when we're new, when we're, when we're rookies, we ask why, we wonder what's possible, you know, and sometimes we just don't know it's impossible, so we try. I found in this research that when we're inexperienced, we actually bring more expertise to bear on the problem, five times more. And it's because we lack expertise, we ask for help, we ask a lot of people and we mobilize a network of experts. When we're inexperienced, we actually deliver faster. Not because we have the skills, because we don't have the skills, and honestly, we're a little bit desperate. We find that when we're new, whether we're 25 or 65 years old, a learner's advantage kicks in. And in the process of asking, of wondering, of discovering, we tend to do our best thinking, often outperforming people with experience. You know, the world is moving fast. We all feel it. Technology has allowed our cycles to spin so fast that in so many cases, we don't even face the same problem twice. We're constantly rookies. And in this reality, it's not what you know, it's how fast you can learn. Alvin Toffler said the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who can't read or write, but those who can't learn, unlearn, and then relearn. So instead of, you know, trying to master this new world, perhaps we approach this world with more childlike wonder, curious, unpretentious, and playful. It's not really about an age, is it? It's about a choice. And we can begin with very simple choices. You know, number one, we can ask more questions. You know, a University of Michigan study found that the average adult asks one to two questions per day. The average preschooler, a hundred. And I think that might be low. <laughs> you know, ask the questions that make people wonder, that get you thinking. Ask why, ask what if. Ask the questions that focus the energy and intelligence of a team on something important uh, and hard and new. Number two, seek novelty. Instead of playing to our strengths, we can sign up to do something hard, something we don't know how to do. Maybe you take a job you're not fully qualified for, or, or travel to a new country, or, or just try a new restaurant. When we put ourselves in situations where we'll be surprised, where our expectations will get violated, this is where learning happens, and this, this is where life gets interesting. Number three, play more. And I don't mean finding more time for play. I mean treating our work as play. Because when our work is play, anything is possible. We improvise, we get resourceful, we laugh at ourselves. You know, we have boundless energy and, and time stands still. But it can be hard to let go of our to-do list and to play. It can be hard to let go of what seems like sure knowledge. 
and to wonder. You know, too often we go kicking and screaming into the dark night of the unknown. But real problems are complex, aren't they? And they're full of unknowns. And perhaps a way to handle our big grown-up problems is to think more like a kid. It seems to me that too many of us are, are stuck trying to climb up career ladders when we would really do better climbing new learning curves. It might be time to, to try something new or hard or to just rediscover something that you think you already know. You know, it might be time to get your rookie on. Yes, the world is, is changing really fast and in some interesting ways. But this means that it's not too late for us to relive our wonder years, to wonder what's possible, and then to go off and do something wonderful. So I say, let's not grow up. At least let's not grow up all the way. Thank you.